tires, 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 tires. This is the brand new radial casing from Schwalbe, and it's got some very bold claims. Oh no, sorry, wait a minute. This is the brand new radial casing from Schwalbe, and it's got some very bold claims. But we've got the same tire, at least save for the carcass, in the same compound and tread pattern to try and examine and understand some of these differences. You see, this is a technology that Schwalbe admit themselves they were surprised they didn't arrive too sooner due to its sheer simplicity, and it's already racked up some famous World Cup wins. But before we get to the how and some of the thinking that's enabled the radial casing, let's look at some of the bare facts in a very simple test. So what does this radial casing allow the tire to do that a standard casing simply doesn't? Well, let's get comfortable because there are some really interesting claims. Schwalbe claim that when comparing apples for apples in terms of the intention of the tire, the radial casing will grant you a 30% larger contact patch on the ground than the traditional carcass, which is quite a lot. Now, because this technology basically makes the tire a bit more supple, you might have to offset the air pressure to get some of that stability back. But even at 29 PSI, the radial casing still has 10% more contact with the ground than the standard tire, which really is something. So let's examine this further. So behind me, we have the makings of a very simple test. And for it, I've called in the help of our in-house tire technician and partnerships correspondent, Toblerone, because he's here to tell you that not only this isn't a review, and a review will be out in due course from our fully independent tech team, but this is a paid partnership with Schwalbe. Schwalbe? Schwalbe? That's just... Schwalbe. Schwalbe, which actually means swallow in German, hence the new hot patches. So what we're gonna do in quite a hodgepodge, but hopefully effective test, is we're gonna put some cooking oil on the tread of these tires and then drop them from head height onto a piece of cardboard. We can then compare the two pieces of cardboard and check out whether they did leave a different imprint, which should indicate contact patch size. Then of course, I'll give these tires a bloody good cleaning before we head to the trails later. So that is a very simple, very rudimentary test to be taken with bucket, no, truckloads of salt. But it does illustrate the point this radial contact patch is larger than the standard. It also seems to have slightly more definition on the side lugs. Now, is that exactly how we ride mountain bikes? No, but simply put, the contact patch is larger. But why is that important? Well, we've come to the woods to try and explain. You see, mountain bikes are horrible to design tires for. And secondly, because of what we're trying to design them to be ridden on. But before we get to that, let's deal with problemo uno oink, why are mountain bikes such a pig to design tires for? So first of all, let's talk about a mountain biking journalist's favorite comparison. Nope, not Formula One, it's the motorbike. So a motorbike is of course a lot heavier than a mountain bike and therefore is preloading the tire, trapping it between the surface and the rim more effectively and more consistently. Now that's gonna fluctuate a lot and it's gonna increase and decrease depending on certain situations. But normally, you can combine the rider and machine weight to mean there's 200 kilograms of force pressing our tires into the ground. With our mountain bikes, however, we have a bike weight of say 15 to 17 kilograms for an enduro bike and a total package that the rider makes up a far greater proportion of in terms of weight. This variation means that there isn't a consistent load always going through the tire. This means that the preload on the tire varies drastically, giving our tires a very difficult task of being both supple and gripping when they need to be, but also supportive when you're going fast and not risking banging through their travel and impacting the rim. If we use low tire pressures, we might have more grip on rocks and roots, but then we're getting something that could perhaps lack support when driving the bike through turns. Conversely, it can also mean if we hit a square edge, we're gonna hit the rim, possibly damaging the wheel itself or slashing the tire. But on the flip side, if we run higher pressures, we're saying goodbye to a lot of that grip. And that's problem number one. Secondly, on our mountain bikes, we almost hunt out weird and wonderful terrain to ride them on. Imagine you're coming down at trail speed on a trail like this. You're gonna be floating on the trail almost, just kissing and grazing off rocks. Now, it's not hard to imagine that on some of these edges, you're only gonna have like a coin's worth of contact patch. And that means that you are doing so much on so little and maximizing that relatively small contact patch on an instance like this 
is going to be really important. Then after deciding to ride our bikes on deliberately weird terrain, we then complain that our tyres are too heavy, they puncture too often, they're too grippy, they don't last long enough, they're not grippy enough. I mean, the list goes on and I'm not pointing the finger. I complain more than almost anyone. Either way, it means that the task of developing mountain bike tyres is a lot more complicated and nuanced than you might think. And we tend to gravitate towards either running the lightest casing we can that we don't constantly puncture on, or the heaviest tyres we can that we don't constantly complain about. It's not as simple as about making one good product that fits everyone. Seemingly, we have to make lots of different products for lots of different needs. And it's not just you and me that complain about our tyres and the need and desire to have them as grippy as possible whilst also protecting our rim adequately. The desire to have that sort of tyre was actually coming from the Commonsalt Muckoff team who, as mentioned previously, have already clocked up a number of victories on this tyre. And this radial technology was made to service their demand to have something that was grippy and puncture resistant. But let's go back to the studio and try and understand what's actually happening inside these tyres and whether it's really as simple as Schwabi say. This is a mountain bike wheel that uses a three cross lacing pattern. Now a cross lacing pattern is all about letting the spokes brace up against each other to help resist torsional or twisting forces as we ride our bikes hard. But it does come at a cost. To incorporate that lacing pattern, you have to make the distance between the hole at the rim and at the hub longer which means you then have to theoretically run the spoke at a higher tension to compensate. This isn't totally dissimilar to what's going on in our tyres, where with a traditional casing, the threads are being run at 45 degrees to one another, much like how these spokes are. Whereas with the radial casing, they cut straight to the point. Next, let's think about a radial lacing pattern for our spokes. And for that, I'm employing the use of a really thick cable tie so you can hopefully see what I mean. Imagine a spoke was running exactly straight from the hub to the rim in a straight line. That could then of course be shorter, which theoretically could mean it could then be run at a lower tension and still support the rider's weight. The radial casing employs a similar theory, with the threads inside the tyre casing, because they have to travel less distance, can be run at a lower tension. Now a radial lacing pattern does have the advantage of each area of the rim being able to work more independently of each other. Now that sounds kind of daft, but hear me out. When you look at our spokes, because they're all braced against each other and they're crossing one another and they're going over and under, you kind of treat sections of a wheel a bit like a team. This group here and this group here. And what that means is it can sometimes be quite hard to isolate certain exact sections of the rim without affecting how the spokes around or even opposite are being tensioned. This is sort of one of the key benefits that Schwabi are going for with their radial casing. Because the, those threads inside the tire run at a lower tension and working more directly, you can then treat each section of tire more independently of one another. And then, the theory goes, get more suppleness. Now that is key to really increasing that contact patch. It's less about the threads working against each other and more about them working independently of one another. And that is at the heart of what radial is. With less crossover between the threads, the carcass can be more supple, which gives you a larger contact patch. That contact patch can then be tuned by increasing the air pressure slightly for your desired feel, as well as choosing the correct level of damping, going off the desired intention of the tire, be that gravity or trail. Of course, increasing the amount of tire that's on the ground at any one time can reduce rolling speed. So that is something to be aware of. An easy way to think about radial casings could be to compare them to the mountain bike fork. Now, if you have a nice, soft, supple air spring, coupled with plenty of compression damping, you can get something that combines a really decent grip with an appropriate level of support. But if you hit something hard enough and fast enough, it doesn't matter how much compression damping you have because you're probably gonna bottom out with potentially disastrous consequences. Now, that's not totally dissimilar to how traditional mountain bike casings have worked, where you can, if you're in the right situation, or I should say the wrong situation, you can use the full travel of the tire, potentially damaging the tire or the rim. The radial casing is all about tuning the relationship between damping and support. In fork terms, it'd be like running slightly less low speed and a bit more air spring to hopefully give you something that's very supple 
whilst also giving good bottom out resistance. So that's how the tyre works. But is it really that easy to tell? Well, let's compare two sets of tyres, both in the same tread and compound and size, and at the same pressure. A perfectly healthy 23 PSI front and rear on the downhill casing, and try and understand whether the difference is as bold as Schwalbe claim, and whether I can pick it up in one run. So let's drop in. I'm gonna go on a blind run, not knowing which tyres I'm on, and how long does it take me to work it out? So, I've come up for my final lap, my blind run, to see if I can work out which tyre is underneath me. Tom has blacked out the sidewalls and sent me on my merry way. Okay. Hopefully we'll be able to see what's going on down here, because it could get a bit dark. Okay, so little instances like that, and like that, feels a bit firm through the turns. Obviously you want a consistent tyre, but you also want something that really encourages you to lean the bike over. Have some turns. Some little rougher sections. Um, oh yeah, deflecting a bit through there. Short little run there. Now, what did I feel? I noticed the tyres in two distinct places. I would say, as you're kind of upright, going, you know, with your body pos position and bike perpendicular to the trail, as you lean into the turn, you get to the apex and you start to transfer from going straight ahead to demanding a bit of support from the turn. You want a tire to, only a little, not too much, but to just almost kind of pivot on the rim. That's gonna really give you a nice feel and a very consistent feeling to then transfer all that load into side load and hit the turn. This casing that I'm currently on felt a little bit reluctant to do so. That's number one, why I think it is the traditional casing. Number two, now when going through a really fast section, it's almost like a pinball section, I want to not so much think about what the tire and the wheel is doing, but rather the axle. Now, if you have a complete translation or a complete trans transmission of all the forces that happen exactly on the trail to your axle, it's gonna feel like it's deflecting a lot. And yes, you can have your suspension really well set up and you get the perfect geometry. But you're kind of playing catch up after that. If you've got a tire that's suitably compliant and has enough given it, it will actually make the front end deflect less, either knocking you left and right or twisting your handlebars as you kind of deflect through those bits. For both those reasons, both in terms of transferring through the turn, as well as how the bike deflects when it hits impacts, I think that this is the traditional casing because at 23 PSI, that radial casing feels drastically different. Now what we've done is we've painted the front tire left and right, and we painted the back tire on the right only, so when I got the bike, I couldn't see, but, da, 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 da. yeah, I'm right. That is the traditional casing, and I'm right, I'm stoked. <laughs> So thank you very much for watching this video. I'm absolutely stoked to get it right. And get in the comments, what do you think of this new radial casing? And does it make sense to you? Thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time.